In Canada in the 1970s, a music teacher named Hans Finger recorded 60 of his elementary school students singing in a gymnasium. He pressed a few vinyl records of those recordings and handed them out to parents. The Langley School Music Project was little known until a record collector named Brian Lind found one of those albums in a thrift store in the year 2000. Lind shared it with some people and eventually, Bar None Records gave it a proper release. The record's cover featured a collage of black and white pictures of the students singing, strumming guitars, playing drums, and clapping along. The album was called Innocence and Despair. The rediscovered recordings were a hit. Salon music critic Stephen Hyden wrote, The gloomy title, Innocence and Despair, is no lie. The echoing, yelping renditions of this feel-good music gives off a powerfully aching melancholy. It's the sound of youth, frozen on tape, as it fades inexorably away. Here's the music teacher from the Langley School Music Project, Hans Finger, talking to Katie Mingle in 2010. Before I was uh, teaching in Langley, I, I played in a heavy metal band. It never occurred to me to be a teacher. I wasn't really a good student myself. and uh, The kids were okay, but I wasn't all that gushy about them, to be honest with you. I knew nothing about kids' music. I knew nothing about teaching. I knew nothing about anything. You know, I had hair, I had attitude, I weighed 98 pounds, but <laughs> off I went to Langley and um, I started teaching. I was, I was hippy-dippy. I had really no philosophy at all about teaching. I had, uh, I can't really say I thought about it a lot, you know. I had a lot of ideas about music, but certainly not about teaching. You know, for me, I mean, I'd been playing in bands since I was like 11 or 12 years old, and it wasn't like anybody taught us. It wasn't even like anybody said, oh, this is the way you do it, or that's the way you do it. We just sort of did it. And I'd been doing music like that since I was a little kid. So when I went in to teach music, it never occurred to me that I was going to teach anybody how to read notes, or that I was going to teach anybody how to pass a test. The only thing I ever tried to teach children is really, is just to fall in love with making music. That, that was always my goal. I just taught songs I knew. And, and, and I was very into David Bowie in those days. I was very into Iggy Pop. Um, I was into uh, Phil's, old Phil Spector records, Brian Wilson. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that um, the songs were thematic. You know, I had gotten a teaching job originally because I was with my girlfriend and, and she was having a baby and I needed a day job. And by the time I got this job, we were breaking up. And I think that in the back of my mind, you know, I was feeling like a, a little bit lost. Contrary to what people think, a lot of kids aren't that happy. Um, they all have troubles, they got problems at home, um, they can feel lonely, they can feel isolated, and the music can conjure up that feeling into them. Now, whether or not they, they completely, literally understand the words, I'm not sure, sure that's so important. I, I don't think Sheila, when she was singing Desperado, really knew what a lot of those references were about, but she certainly captured the feeling of the song. other school choirs and things we sounded so different and so weird you know <laughs> that I thought oh well we can't be any good I mean listen to all those people they really know how to sing so 
<laughs> I, I never thought of it in terms of it was special because it was good. I always thought of it in terms of it was special because it was different. Oftentimes, I would have 60, 90 kids in my class, and they'd be all over the place because there was no room, and we'd have instruments, and I, we had no equipment, so I brought in all the equipment from my band, which were huge Marshall amplifiers and bass guitars and all kinds of things. The kids, of course, really liked that. So there wasn't much room, and kids were practically on top of one another, and uh, I, I just sort of arranged them according to height, and uh, that was it. <laughs> I always felt like with my music teaching that I always was an outsider music teacher, you know? I mean, I never I never really participated in a lot of the music teaching events and all that kind of stuff. I was always like this little island unto myself. You know, people always use this, this term, like thinking outside the box and all that, but I, th- I think, for me, I didn't even know there was a box, you know? I mean, I... <laughs> It does have the sort of the children of the corn, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does, it does have that feeling. Well, I think we were kind of like a little cult, you know? So It became kind of a, a kind of an underground hit in New York. Um, Tony Visconti, who was David Bowie's producer, had heard it, and uh, I think he thought it was a new wave band from New Jersey. And... Um, he couldn't quite believe there was a bunch of little kids <laughs> from some farm country in Canada. Yeah, I have students um, that still do music to this day. Um, They're always in touch with me. I jam with some of them once in a while. I felt that the whole success of this was a really vindicating kind of experience. It made me feel really like, wow, I can do something. So it was great. I mean, when, you know, I had always taught my students in a really positive way. And then when somebody suddenly is positive about what you're doing like that, it gives you a great feeling. Our own Katie Mingle talked to Hans Finger of the Langley School Music Project in 2010 for the show ReSound, produced by the Third Coast International Audio Festival. If you want to hear innovative documentaries from all over the world, you must subscribe to the ReSound podcast. And here are some fun facts. I worked on ReSound at Third Coast for three years, and during that time, I hired Delaney Hall as an intern in 2006. It was her first radio job. And then when I left, Delaney took over, and she hired Katie Mingle who eventually took over the show herself. Now, we all work here. So, if you like us, you'll take ReSound. 99% Invisible was produced this week by Sean Cole, Emmett Fitzgerald, and Katie Mingle. Mix and tech production by Sharif Youssef. Music by Sean Rial. Kurt Kolstad is the digital director. The rest of the team includes senior editor Delaney Hall, Avery Truffleman, Taryn Mazza, Joe Rosenberg, Vivian Lee, and me, Roman Mars. We are a project of 91.7 KALW in San Francisco and produced on Radio Row in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. 99% Invisible is a member of Radiotopia from PRX, a fiercely independent collective of the most innovative shows in all of podcasting. You can find them all at radiotopia.com.
Roman.fm. You can find the show and join discussions about the show on Facebook. You can tweet at me at Roman Mars and the show at 99PI.org. We're on Instagram, Tumblr, and Reddit too. But if you're thinking, I need more 99PI in my life, we have old episodes and new articles about design every couple of days on our website. It's 99PI.org.